Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Breakfast Club number seven. Um, and we actually do feel really lucky today because joining us is the Academy's Chief of Science, Dr. Shannon Bennett. Hey, Shannon. Hi, Laurel. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Um, so in addition to being our chief of science, Dr. Bennett is a virologist, a molecular epidemiologist, our curator of microbiology, and the Hein Dean Science of Research, Dean of Science and Research Collections. I had to write that down. That's how it's <laughs> that mouthful. Yeah. It doesn't fit on my business card very well either. You should, I feel like you should be allowed like an expanding, unfoldable business card. Yeah, both sides at least. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Shannon studies all kinds of infectious agents, uh, parasites, bacteria, viruses, but she specializes in diseases that can be transmitted from non-human animals to humans. So that means um, dengue, hantaviruses, and yes, COVID-19. Um, so she's going to take your questions on all of those things toward the end of the program. Just leave them in the comment section anytime. Um, but first, Dr. Bennett's going to talk to us about how someone actually decides to devote their life uh, to this field in the first place. And um, I really suggest like grab your coffee, really settle in for this one because this story is seriously fascinating. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Bennett for life and times of a parasitologist, the perils and passions when you tangle with a coronaviral world. Thanks again, Shannon. You're welcome. Thanks, Laurel. And thanks everybody for joining me for this morning. And I really do hope you have your copies. I've got mine. So I wanted to start by taking you through um, uh, my life, my early life, when I uh, first was an undergraduate college student trying to decide what I wanted to do with my life. And I had an opportunity to go to Liberia, West Africa and volunteer for the summer. My job was to teach grade five math in an upcountry school near the Guinea border and um, run a theater program in the evenings on primary healthcare uh, themes, like what's a vaccine for and what's good hygiene. So I, uh, this is me, this is me back then. So I was 19 years old. Um, I was heading up into the field. This was on the, you know, on, on, the, on the one side with the backpack, there I am in Monrovia, the capital. And then we got into a, a pickup truck and we drove up country to the Guinea border. And um, I started this wonderful uh, journey and adventure. And, you know, like any good traveler, uh, I went to the health clinic before I left and I got my anti-malarials and I got any vaccines that I might need, yellow fever, et cetera. And, um, you know, very quickly, I, uh, this, so this is me with one of my other travel buddies outside of our, our hut. And um, it was only a few days after this picture was taken that I came down with malaria. So malaria is a eukaryote parasite, single-celled parasite that lives in your blood. This is an image of uh, the trophozoite stage, the ring stage of Plasmodium falciparum. So I picked up Plasmodium falciparum. It's transmitted to humans by the bite of a mosquito, a night biting mosquito. I had my bed net and I had my anti-malarials. So what fascinated me about this infection was, uh, you know, why didn't those measures work? What, what happened? And it turned out that everybody said, ah, this, this Plasmodium falciparum parasite has been resistant to that anti-malarial for at least three months now. So it was my first encounter with the real um, cost and impact of a fast evolving pathogen that escapes our, some of our control methods. So, you know, that, that, was, that was rough. So this parasite, when it gets into your bloodstream, uh, it copies itself in a red blood cell. And then when there are, are enough copies, the pressure of all the progeny in the red blood cell explodes the red blood cell. And then those progeny get into new red blood cells. And so this happens synchronously, waves and waves of progeny, malaria, parasites, getting in your red blood cells, replicating, exploding your red blood cell. And the fever cycle, that's the hallmark of malaria, represents your body's response to that explosion, massive wave of exploding red blood cells. So every few, every 24 to 36 hours, defend, depending on the species, you're basically decimated by an extreme uh, fever and chill, uh, fever, chills, body shaking. It's, it's really, it flattened me. But then in between those cycles of exploding red blood cells, I felt fine and I'd go about my business and keep teaching and I was doing my laundry like you saw. Um, I was also, you know, eating the local food and that's when I picked up 
So I'm still going through malaria here, but that's when I picked up this little pathogen. So this one is called Entamoeba histolytica, and it gets into your mouth. Uh, you ingest it from food that's, or, or some kind of um, water droplet that's been contaminated by fecal material. So it lives in your intestines and it's transmitted by feces. And then you, something you eat uh, is contaminated with it. And so I ingest, I must have ingested it, not on purpose, and I got infected with this Entamoeba histolytica. And it causes severe diarrhea as it's tunneling around in your intestine. And what it does is it sort of grazes down the villi and then can punch through into the lining of your intestine and, and can cause bleeding in your stool and your intestine. So it's called amoebic dysentery. So I had severe dysentery. And if you look in your stool, which every good parasitologist should get in the habit of inspecting your stool, uh, you could see this sort of coffee ground look, which was the dried blood in, in my stool from this tunneling uh, parasite. So that, that kind of sucked. I was, I was very sick uh, with, with the entamoeba and malaria at the same time. So they uh, took me on a, on a little moped to the nearest um, care facility, which was at least five miles away. It was actually a nursing group associated with a leper colony. And on the way, uh, we had a spill and I got a cut in my in my leg, and I picked up in um, a staph infection. So this is Staphylococcus aureus. And you're probably thinking, there's no way. I'm gonna take a, a sip of coffee, but I tell you, I swear this is all true. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee. So I picked up Staphylococcus aureus. It was introduced into the wound, and it began to copy and divide. So Staphylococcus aureus is a bacterium. The first two that I told you about were uh, single-celled parasites in the uh, eukaryotes like us. And um, Staph aureus is a little different than the other two because Staph aureus is uh, a, a, path of, a bacterium that lives on your skin for many, many people. And it never causes trouble. It's sort of part of many people's microbiomes it's an extreme opportunist. So when it had that opportunity to, in, to get introduced into a wound in conditions where I couldn't clean it properly, um, and it was a, a nice sort of humid environment, <clears throat> it just, it went gangbusters and, and really took hold. And so I had a staph uh, infection as well. So they, they kept me at the leper colony and they, they wanted to take, uh, take care of all these things. Uh, and so I was pretty sick. I had my fever chill cycle from the malaria. I had amoebic dysentery, which was being treated by just hydration. And then I had a, a burgeoning staph aureus infection in my leg that was being treated. And I had a lot of time to sort of ponder my condition and the state that I found myself in. And the first thing that impressed me at that moment was how many different ways uh, Parasites and pathogens have figured out how to get around, get between hosts, move host to host, and how many different ways they also figured out how to break down all of our defenses. So we have you know, malaria, which is transmitted by mosquito. We have um, entamoeba histolytica, which is transmitted by fecal oral contamination. And then we have a lurking opportunist which sits on our skin and can dive in when there's an opportunity to overcopy itself. And in all cases, these uh, parasites also have the capacity to evolve. So the Plasmodium falciparum parasite had already evolved resistance to the medication that I was on. And Staph aureus is now well known to have uh, multi-strain uh, resistant forms to all kinds of antibiotics. So I was really um, determined to pursue what I call um, the art of parasitism. I wanted to understand why parasites uh, could uh, rapidly evolve and take advantage of all these different opportunities and how that could contrast it across the different kinds of parasites and the kinds of life cycles that they had. Um, while I was pondering all this, I was actually um, in the leper colony, and this was in 1989. This is a couple of years before the Liberian Civil War. And I heard gunshots, a lot of gunshots, machine guns. 
And uh, the first attempted coup for that civil war occurred while I was hospitalized in that leper colony. And that, um, that was an extremely violent time. The entire uh, village shut down. We were on lockdown in the leper colony. I couldn't be evacuated, but many, many, many people were killed. And I was told later that if I hadn't been in the leper colony, I most certainly would have been one of those uh, killed in the attempted coup. So at the end of the day, parasites saved my life. So that's, uh, that's my personal story, but it's not just about me. I had, um, a, this, these are my students that I was teaching math to during the day. And the things that I observed when I was working there that didn't impact me were also a, a great lesson in how parasitism is a, a, a huge deal and how it can really impact people's lives. So this is a picture of uh, two common infections that people can get in uh, in West Africa in, in many parts of Africa. This is uh, on the on the far left is schistosomiasis. It's a it's a flatworm, a fluke that can live in your intestine or in your urinary tract. And the the female is the small dark worm, and the male is the big worm around it. And they make for life in this incopula form, and they take up residence and make eggs. The, the female lays eggs that flow out into your um, system. And it's it, as the worm burden grows and as, as, as children get more and more of these worms, they acquire them in fresh water where the snail intermediate host leaks the progeny into the water and then they pick them up through their skin. Um, the, the, the children can actually emit blood in their urine and in their intestine. And so in this part of Africa, the, the older boys would actually go through a kind of menses, just like the girls, because the worm burden was so high that they would be bleeding uh, at around uh, 14, 15 years old. And then the other parasite that's here is called Dracunculus metanensis. It's a worm that's transmitted by copepod. People ingest water that's not clean, that has these tiny copepods that are bearing the larvae of this worm. And then the worm migrates into the body cavity and eventually after mating, the females go into the peripheral appendages, the legs, the arms, and they grow to up to a meter long or three feet long and they create a blister in the skin. And when a person goes into water to cool that blister, the larvae burst out of the female worm into the water column to be picked up by another copepod. So people walk around with these painful abscesses of this, this meter long worm in their veins. And this is a picture in the middle of somebody trying to extract that worm a bit, one little tiny bit at a time. And if you extract it too fast, you'll actually, um, uh, cause it to break and it'll be worse than it, than uh, ever. And so sometimes they use a little match stick and you can see on the lower right corner, there's a little match with the tiny bit of the worm sort of twisted around it. And although many people ascribe the uh, symbol in medicine to, um, to uh, a, a, a Greek uh, reference, I actually think and many think that it's actually uh, the, the image of this Dracunculus metanensis nematode wrapped around a stick uh, that is a common way of treating it in Africa, but it, now it's been eradicated. So all of these people that I worked with um, could have been exposed and many of them were carrying these parasites, though I did not carry these parasites. But it did lead me on, um, on a, one more step on my journey. So when I came back uh, to uh, Canada, I'm Canadian, and picked up my graduate um, work in parasitology, I, I picked a worm to work on that was very closely related to Dracunculus metanensis. It's a worm that lives in, um, in aquatic systems and it infects copepods. So on the right, there's me fishing, catching fishes and copepods. I collected copepods too. And there's a little copepod in the upper right. And if you can see it, there's a little worm a tiny larval worm curled up around its intestine. And that worm is, is, um, is a larval form when the copepod is ingested by one of these fishes, the worm develops. And then eventually the adult worms poke out through the gills. So unlike the human appendages where it's in the vein system of your legs or arms, this is a worm that will poke out through the gills of the fish and then give rise to the progeny into the water system. So what I was fascinated by, uh, what fascinated me 
about this system was that this worm uh, was a, a, an expert at jumping into new hosts. And that really uh, emerged as my fundamental interest. How do these parasites uh, jump in and capture new hosts? And if they do jump into new hosts, is it just um, a test? Are they just sort of pinging the landscape of opportunities? Or are there key evolutionary changes that have to happen for it to capture that host? So that, that was my um, inspiration from, from Africa to really not only understand where pathogens come from, but how they jump into new hosts and then what makes them successful in those new hosts. So um, unfortunately, these worms were really fun to work with, but they didn't evolve fast enough for me, for me to really get my hand on um, how, how evolution could really play a role in driving host capture. So I switched to mosquitoes and um, viruses. So I've studied many different kinds of viruses. One of the viruses that Laurel mentioned is hantavirus. Hantavirus is a virus of rodents and other small mammals like shrews. And it's an expert host jumper. Uh, it can capture new hosts. It's done it over the many uh, millennia that it's been um, in existence. And uh, one of the reasons it can do this so well is that it has a sectioned genome, kind of like flu. So it can shuffle the deck of its genetic information and pick up new capabilities or new functions that might uh, be important to capture a new host. Um, a lot of other viruses are more simple. They don't have a section genome. It's all in one uh, strip. And so what I was really fascinated about was to look at how different kinds of viruses could evolve um, and how rapidly and where those evolutionary changes might occur to make them better or not so labile at jumping into new hosts. So I like to think of this um, little mosquito as teeming with great information. Uh, it's teeming, if you look at its abdomen, with, with blood, it's full of blood, and that blood is teeming with the microbes of the, the vertebrate whose blood it is. But then the mosquito itself is also teeming with its own microbes. It's got viruses, bacteria, fungi, just like we have a microbiome, mosquitoes also have a gut microbiome. And so I'm using mosquitoes to give me a window into the natural world. Uh, I wanna know where viruses are distributed in nature amongst many different kinds of vertebrates. And I wanna know what that diversity of viruses is and how it's related to the viruses that spill over into humans and cause disease. So it's going back to this idea of trying to understand what is driving a zoonotic infectious disease or a disease that emerges from non-human animals into humans. Is it ecological opportunity? Is it key evolutionary switches? Does it depend more on the virus's genetic architecture rather than any specific changes? So this has been um, my life's work since um, coming uh, back from Africa and then going through grad school working on worms and now moving into viruses and mosquitoes. So this mosquito is actually the vector of dengue virus and dengue is an expert um, in, in a group of viruses that are very good at capturing different hosts. Um, and dengue and its relatives like Zika move actually between non-human primates and human primates very easily. So they're quite a good host jumper at that level. So um, thinking of mosquitoes as a hypodermic needle collecting blood and microbes in the environment to give me a picture of what the diversity of viruses in nature looks like and what their pathway is to capturing humans. So this is me. Um, in the in the jungles of Thailand, setting up a different uh, different approaches to capture mosquitoes. In the middle, I'm holding a series of light traps. Uh, on the far upper corner, on the right, I'm setting up a, a trap that collects mosquitoes that are gravid, so the females that want to lay eggs. There's a net bag. Um, in the lower right, I've got uh, myself and my students at a rice field where invasive mosquitoes really drive the community, and then I. I made my daughter help me uh, at one point, and there she is uh, looking for mosquito larvae. Mosquitoes lay their eggs in water, and she's fishing with a scooper in an abandoned toilet 
uh, to uh, to collect mosquito larvae, and my postdoc is hovering over her. So she um, uh, really objects to going out with me into the field now. And in, indeed, it is. This is these areas are all uh, full of potential dengue as well as other pathogens. So we ha we have to protect ourselves and be very careful. But um, it's uh, it's uh, I think hopefully she will thank me one day, and I promise I won't show this at her graduation party. Anyway, um, so. Once we collect the mosquitoes, um, we actually want to break them open to look at their viruses. So that picture I showed you of the, of the mosquito before, that was actually my leg. And that mosquito was feeding on my leg. And my husband, Darrell, wanted to get a really great picture of her. So she, he made me sit really still. And he let her feed and feed and feed. And that picture was actually taken in Hawaii, where there's no endemic dengue. So I was safe. But um, she finally. Uh, ingested so much of my blood that she passed out. So this is her on a green leaf, laying on her back with her leg flung over her left shoulder. Um, and uh, it's just like the way you feel after eating too much turkey at Thanksgiving. She just completely wiped out. And But she wasn't dead. So we later popped her in a tube, which I show here in the middle, and there she is in, in the tube, and, and she's just fine, right? Except that then I move her over into the right hand side, which is our laboratory. And my student, Rachel Liu, is there putting uh, that mosquito into a little blender with a bead, uh, a couple of beads that shatter up her body part. We froze her first so that she was asleep when we did this. But we basically have this really, really fancy Vitamix in the lab where we pop the mosquitoes in, in tubes and uh, we shatter their, their body parts and break open their cells and release any genetic material, including the genetic material of viruses and other microbes and the genetic material in their host uh, blood from their, the blood meal of the host that they fed upon. So that allows us to look for microbial um, diversity. We, we use genetic techniques in the lab at the academy to sequence all those, those genetic signatures and then use bioinformatics to associate those genetic signatures with the right creature. So sometimes it's the vertebrate blood meal, um, it's a vertebrate, a primate, or something else. Sometimes it's um, a, mi a microbe like a, a bacteria, a fungi, and viruses. So we look them all. We can collect all that information and look at it later. And what we've been finding is um, we've been discovering many, many, many new viruses. And all the new viruses we've found are shown in yellow. So there are ye these yellow boxes on the slide. And those yellow boxes represent many, many new viruses that we've discovered in these mosquitoes. And some of them are, are associated with the blood meal, and some of them are associated with the mosquito. So they're mosquito viruses. And in fact, it turns out that many of these are mosquito viruses, but they are related to viruses that spill over into humans and cause disease. And so all the viruses in these different family trees, which these are family trees that were built based on the genetic information in the new viruses we discovered, as well as all the known viruses out there. And we've binned these family trees into the major groups, the genuses, for example, like flavivirus, virus on the left, flavi in the middle. And what this tells us is that there's a rich diversity of viruses in nature and many of them are even mosquito viruses, but that they are related. They're in the same family tree, sometimes sister, cousins, sometimes even ancestral to many of the viruses that cause disease in humans and human associated um, plants and animals. So it's an, it's, it brings us to uh, this point where we now understand that nature is teeming with virus diversity and that viruses are evolutionarily nimble enough that when there is an ecological opportunity they can evolve um, the ability to infect humans so that brings us to coronavirus so coronavirus is part of a group of viruses the coronaviridae that is very good, they're not mosquito born, but they live in um, natural systems. They're a very diverse group of viruses. 
they um, have a slightly different genetic architecture in that they tend to naturally recombine very easily. And uh, they're, they're expert at jumping into new hosts. They're very good at getting into different kinds of mammals. And so we're, we're pretty sure that this virus emerged uh, from bats. So I'll just say, uh, one thing I forgot to say is that this virus is named SARS coronavirus 2. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. And it's called coronavirus 2 because it's related to uh, SARS coronavirus, the first one, which emerged uh, from a wet market in China in about uh, in 2002. So they're close cousins, and that's why this virus is called SARS coronavirus 2. We don't know exactly uh, which animal it uh, emerged from into humans directly. No one's traced that contact, that, that chain of transmission back to the exact animal. But when we put SARS coronavirus 2 into a family tree, we see its relationship with MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, with SARS-1, and we also see that it's very closely related to a diverse set of viruses that occur in bats. And these were bats that were sampled uh, starting in 2013 to 2017 under different auspices. So they're not directly the culprit of the spillover. They're just a representative sample of all the virus diversity that is in bats that's related to this virus that we now call SARS coronavirus 2. So it emerged in, in Wuhan, China, in uh, as early as uh, we now know December, probably late November. Uh, the genetic information tells us that, but this is actually a graph of the cases, the cases that were first identified in what we call a case cluster. So when you see many cases occurring, um, and it's in a, in a very constrained space and time situation, it's called a case cluster. And the thing that stood out about this case cluster was that it was a, a fever. It was definitely these were cases that hit the healthcare system associated with fever and severe respiratory distress. Uh, and they weren't uh, pinned, they weren't able to pin those, those uh, symptoms on any of the regular culprits. So it was not influenza. Uh, so that was the first signal that this was a case cluster of unknown cause. And, um, the, the problem at that point was that nobody had figured out that it was not just many instances of animal to human transmission. Nobody uh, first rang the alarm bells that this was efficient human to human transmission. And part of the problem that muddied the waters was that all of these cases were associated with a wet market where there were abundant live um, and dead uh, animals, many of which were wildlife. So. Uh, it, it masqueraded the uh, efficient human to human transmission that had evolved and was the hallmark of this case cluster. And those associated market cases were sh are shown in red in that graph. And the image on the top corner is the uh, market itself with the blue tarps uh, denoting the different kinds of stalls. So uh, it emerged in China and we all know how it played out from there and we're all still sheltering in place um, in response to what went on from there. So here is a graph that shows two things. Uh, on the top are the cumulative cases and the cumulative deaths. And on the bottom are the daily new cases and daily deaths. And on the uh, y-axis, it's um, charted on a log scale because it helps to reduce the variation so we can see it better and all on the same scale. So you can see that China, in the, starting in January, moving into December, spiked up very rapidly, but now it's leveled off, right? Starting in March, it, the curve um, started to level off on the top, and that's corresponding to a, a slow reduction, a decrease in the rate of daily new cases, and that's shown on the bottom in orange. And so when people talk about flattening the curve, or they describe the epidemic wave, they're really talking about the graph on the bottom, the daily new cases. An epidemic wave is when the daily new cases are increasing exponentially at the beginning. Their rate of growth changes and starts to flatten out, that's the peak. 
and then the rate of new cases starts to go down. So that doesn't mean that there aren't new cases every day, but there are fewer new cases day over day. And that's the end of the wave. The peak has passed and it's starting to, I just dropped my coffee cup, I'm okay. So it's starting to go down the other side. And that corresponds to this leveling off of the curve on the top. And so China's on the far left and you can see South Korea, Japan, Italy, Germany, we've all seen them in the news going through these different stages and then finally the US on the right. And you can see that South Korea is um, has leveled off. They're uh, keeping their cases, their new cases down to a fairly consistent level, just like China. Japan, in contrast, had a different growth uh, dynamic. They grew more slowly. Uh, they're still not under control, but Italy, Germany and even the US are starting to see that they've peaked in the number of daily new cases and maybe starting to head down the other side. Certainly with Italy and Germany, it's heading down the other side and US starting to head down the other side. So let's take ourselves to the US and we can see a few of the states that um, I've been watching in particular. Washington was the first state to see some pretty significant growth and it's definitely controlling the um, amount of daily new cases and starting to level off. So flattening the curve is working. California, flattening the curve is working. Louisiana, New York. Even New York, which is hit very hard, flattening the curve um, is starting to work. So uh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about why coronavirus, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 is such a bear in this situation. Um, part of the problem is this is a, a graph that shows the course of infection. And the, the key uh, takeaway from this graph is that there is a very long incubation period between when somebody is infected and when they start to show symptoms. And during that incubation period, people can transmit this virus. And that means that people can move about in society and be infected and be transmitting the virus and not be known uh, to be infected and transmitting, not known to themselves and definitely not hitting the radar of our healthcare uh, detection systems. Furthermore, the symptoms are highly variable. So sometimes they're mild and they persist to be very mild um, even if they do eventually develop. And people can transmit throughout this period uh, whether the symptoms are severe or not, they can still transmit. And that means it's been really hard to measure um, and lock down the spread of this virus because there are so many undetected transmitters and transmission events. The other uh, uh, part of this um, uh, virus to, to note, you've heard a lot about uh, droplets and aerosol particles. And indeed, this virus can be transmitted in droplets of various sizes. And I show this diagram of a sneeze to just capture for you how many different sizes of droplets are in a sneeze. And we don't really um, know uh, how efficient this virus is. New information comes out every day in terms of how it can survive in the tiniest of droplets. We know that it can be definitely spread in the big droplets, but big dro droplets drop off after six feet or so. Uh, what's really not well known is how well they can persist in the very, very tiny droplets that can float in the air longer and move farther away. Uh, and this is particularly dangerous in a healthcare setting where people are um, doing procedures like intubation and uh, aerosolizing the virus mechanically, or they're in a closed room with people that are very, very sick where there's a lot of tiny droplets in that room. And so that's why everybody is saying that healthcare workers need the best protection. They need to protect themselves with these N95 masks in particular. Uh, this virus can also be transmitted by contaminated surfaces. So when you cough or sneeze, you can deposit droplets on surfaces and those droplets can contain the virus and someone else can come along and pick them up and then touch their eyes or nose or mouth and give themselves the virus through surface contamination. And th those are called fomites. I often think about my phone as a phonite because phones are covered with stuff, right? So clean your phone a lot. Anyway, so phonites, I mean fomites are, can be, are very serious. Um, and uh, we now have new data that 
that fomites, uh, that viruses can live on surfaces for up to 72 hours. Um, and that's just one study. So everything we know about this virus can change. Um, so those two things, how it's transmitted and um, how it can be transmitted throughout the course of infection and even the incubation period, all those things sort of go into the hopper about how we represent the virus's capacity to cause an epidemic. And that's uh, really boils down to its reproductive number. The reproductive number is how many infections, a single new infections, a single infected person can give rise to. So for example, we have um, MERS, which I told you was a cousin of SARS on, on the far left with a reproductive number of 0.7. That means it's not very efficient at transmitting between people. One person only gives rise to less than one case. The black is the person and the red is the new case. In the middle, we have SARS coronavirus too. So it's being estimated that it has a reproductive number of anywhere from two to four with a median of about 2.5. And so you can see this person on the top in black is giving rise to about 2.5 new infections on average. And then there's SARS-CoV-1, the first one, and it's actually got a, a mean uh, reproductive number of about four. And so that's much more efficient at, tr at transmitting person to person. However, we were able to control SARS-1. And partly that was because SARS cannot transmit at, before symptoms develop. And, in, and actually, not, it, it doesn't even transmit until symptoms are well developed. So it's very easy to identify and isolate cases and stop that chain of transmission and reduce the effective reproductive number to zero. And that's what happened with the 2002-2003 outbreak. And then on the far right is a table that just shows you some of the other viruses that we uh, might um, use as our um, benchmarks. There's um, measles, which is an incredibly efficient transmitter. Uh, it can survive in particles, aerosolized particles in the air for a long time. It's very resistant to drying out, which SARS-CoV-2 is not. Um, some of my um, viruses that I work on, like Zika, is at the bottom there, and it's got a pretty uh, highly transmissible um, reproductive number. So um, <clears throat> when we roll up the reproductive rate of, um, of SARS-CoV-2 and compare it to some of the other viruses on that table, and we also compare it uh, to those other viruses based on it, how um, serious, how virulent it is, or its uh, mortality rate, you get this graphic here, which is from the New York Times, thank you. And on the far, um, on the uh, y-axis is the more case fatality rate, and on the x-axis is the reproductive number that I just told you about. And the pink box in the middle shows where this new coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, kind of sits. It's a box instead of a point because there's so much uncertainty around um, these measurements, these parameter measurements. and they differ by population. We won't really know the true uh, situation with this virus until we look retrospectively after the virus has passed. And we have better ways of detecting uh, the, um, the cases that uh, never hit the clinical uh, detection system. So um, you can see that this is a fairly serious virus and we need to take it very seriously when we talk about flattening the curve. So one of the things that's really exciting to me uh, at this time to be a scientist, and I, I, I'm not excited about SARS-CoV-2, but I am excited about the collective collaborative process that the world is taking to solve this virus and solve this epidemic. And so there's a many, many dashboards and, and sharing of data that's available in real time. This is just one, uh, one of my favorites is Worldometer, which gives you um, country by country data and within the US state by state data. Um, the other one that really is exciting to me is uh, nextstrain.org, which is uh, pooling all of the genetic information. There's over 3,500 genetic sequences available that um, we can now analyze and ask questions like, how is this virus evolving? What are the key parts of the genome that are allowing it to be very efficient for human to human transmission? So I'm going to show you nextstrain.org in a minute, but before I go there, I just want to put the virus into its bigger family tree. I mentioned that 
Uh, it's related to SARS and MERS, and there's uh, SARS-CoV-2 in red at the top. And um, this is a very pretty big genome uh, for a virus. It's a single-stranded RNA virus, so very similar to dengue and Zika that I study from mosquitoes. It's not segmented the way hantavirus or influenza viruses are. And it's changing on average um, about one to three changes per month. That's a sort of background rate of evolution. And, and that's, it, it's playing out that way in humans as well. And you can see by its relationship to this orange uh, flagged sample, the precursor, uh, it's called a precursor because it's sort of, it looks ancestral to the SARS-CoV-2 and it was found in a bat. And this is a horseshoe bat um, that I showed you uh, before on the second picture of and there's also been some sequences that have been found in pangolins, and those are shown in turquoise, and then you can see SARS in, in a dark purple and MERS in kind of a fuchsia. And then, interestingly, it turns out that I mentioned this virus is pretty good at jumping into other mammals, including humans. It turns out that relatives of SARS-CoV-2 have jumped into humans at least four different times over the last hundred years. And those are shown in green. And they uh, cause a common cold-like syndrome. So they're part of every year when people get the common cold, 10 to 30% of those cases are human coronavirus, seasonal human coronavirus causing the cold. So uh, that that it's a very different virus. It doesn't cause nearly the symptoms or pathogenicity that we see in SARS-CoV-2 but it's interesting to note. So um, I just wanna to touch on one of the, I talked about what are the changes that are maybe underlying the ability of this virus to jump into humans and transmit. It turns out one of the key uh, proteins is called the spike protein. It acts like a key that binds to a host cell receptor and unlocks the door, unlocks the host cell so that the virus can get into the cell and start to replicate its genome and make progeny. And it turns out that the changes in the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 are quite distinct, and they're shown in red in this figure relative to SARS-1, many, many changes, and even relative to the bat precursor, which are shown in red right here, and the host cell receptor is shown in turquoise, and the spike protein is in gray, and the differences are in red. So you can see that there are some key changes that probably help um, this virus be more efficient at infecting humans relative to its ancestral form in bats. So this is one of the most exciting, fun things I love to play with. It's the um, uh, publicly deposited resource for studying the genetic information, and it's color-coded by um, geographic region. And you can see the, the dark purple are, are from China and the map on the right shows the location in China. And then you can see this sort of swarm of sort of green and yellow, that's Europe. And then the US is in red. And so it shows that, you know, the US has had, um, has received many viruses from China, that's Washington, right? And then it's also been sort of part of this bigger, larger global circulation pattern. So there's lots of movement of humans uh, bringing this virus to many countries around the world. And if you float across any of those, if you take some time to go look at nextstrain.org, which I encourage you to, it's super fun. You can float over the spots and highlight which countries things come from. And you can play a little video that rolls out the evolution of this virus over time and space. Uh, on the bottom is a slice of the genome showing peaks where the changes are occurring in the genome. And we see that there are changes occurring in patchy spots, um, but all over the genome, but hot spots of, of change. And one of those hot spots is, does include the spike protein. But in general, it's not evolving at an unnaturally accelerated rate from what we would expect based on that one to three changes a month that I mentioned. So I just wanna close by saying that um, this virus definitely has the potential to spread uh, very rapidly if unchecked, if we don't do anything. And we do need to stay the course and continue to flatten the curve. And the flattening the curve really is referring to this figure, which um, is trying to bring the growth rate, the doubling rate of the virus to a lower, uh, less accelerated rate so that it doubles in number over a longer period of time. 
And so it moves the curve from that red epidemic wave I talked about to the blue epidemic wave. It might be that it doesn't ultimately change the total number of cases. The area under the curve is probably about the same. But what it means is that it will dribble the severe cases into the healthcare system at a slower rate and at a rate that the healthcare system can respond and reduce the case fatality rate. So it's really flattening the curve, essentially reduces the fatality rate of this virus because we can stay up on it better and care for people better. In the meantime, healthcare capacity is being boosted with better testing. I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, to see all the, all the tests that are being um, up, sc scaled up. Um, and there are re hundreds to thousands of clinical trials listed on public databases on the WHO and NIH websites, and you can browse those trials. It's amazing work being advanced on both vaccines as well as therapeutics. So what can you do? You can wash your hands, you can stay home, and uh, now recent information suggests the CDC would also like us to wear cloth masks if we cannot social distance. So uh, thank you very much, and I think I, I can take some questions. Thanks so much, Shannon. That was really, really helpful and informative and also horrifying for the first part. <laughs> um, we did get a ton of questions and lots of people actually had questions um, about the early part of your talk about parasites and mosquitoes. And I'm gonna save those and loop back on those later. While we have you live, I wanna ask the questions that obviously the questions that relate to what everybody is facing right now. So sure. uh, Timothy's question references the, what actually what you just said about masks. He asks, what are the facts about wearing a non-medical grade mask if you're not infected? Does it offer any extra protection at all? I feel like I'm seeing com conflicting reports. Yeah, um, so it, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of information that uh, has not been vetted by a, by a fully scientific peer reviewed process. And so a lot of the information that we're getting truly is our best guess. So with that caveat, there is only circumstantial evidence about the protection that masks can confer. So um, the only factual lab-based evidence was a study that showed the viruses um, uh, in different particle sizes in a lab setting where a mechanical nebulizer was used to show that the viruses could be distributed in particles as small as 0.1 micron. Now 0.1 micron is a millionth of a, a micron is a millionth of a meter. So 0.1 microns is even smaller. Um, and, and if you look at the, uh, the droplet distribution produced by a mechanical event like a nebulizer or an intubation event, then the droplets, um, that then the size does skew down towards the smaller end of the distribution compared to a cough or a sneeze. Mm -hmm. So when, unless we're in a hospital setting where mechanical uh, devices are being used to nebulize the virus, we kind of think that most people out there are not producing very many of the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest particles. But in theory, the lab data shows that the virus could be in those tiniest of tiniest of tiniest particles. Now, a, a, an N95 mask means that it 95% of the particles are filtered out. Those particles have only been tested down to 0.3 microns. So even an N95 with a built-in HEPA filter may not be that effective against the tail of the distribution of 0.1 microns, but that is like very tail distribution. So the circumstantial evidence is that we have reports of people in taxis, in Ubers, in families, hanging out with unsymptomatic people and getting infected. And, and, and so we don't know, we don't know if that's because they're sharing breath. We don't know if there were fomites on the surface, but in an abundance of caution, this is why people are now saying, this is the data that's emerged, this sort of anecdotal case-by-case -case basis, that people are still getting infected, even though people are not symptomatic, that we just say, okay, well, let's try a cloth mask. But 
none of those cloth masks have been tested for the particle size that they might block, whether it's particles you produce or particles you inhale. And uh, my mom would say, buy percale sheet material or the best you can with the tightest weave and then use, use something like that. But you know, there's so many unknowns and we just have to try to um, use an abundance of caution. Right. So I guess in the in the in the world outside of a place where people might be using nebulizers or things that, that emit these teeny tiny particles where people are more likely to sneeze or cough or something like that, then basically the recommendation is yes, like wear anything that covers your face because it could help. It could offer additional protection. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and I think the caveat being don't don't think like it's your uh, superpower. Right. <laughs> you know, you still need to first do all those other things. First, right. wash your hands. First, wash surfaces. First, social distance. And then, once you've gone through all of that, right. by all means, cover yourself with a cloth. If you're not caring for somebody sick, if you're caring for somebody sick, you need to wear an N95. Right. Okay. So if you're wearing a mask, don't get any closer to people than you would normally. But good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's not a superpower. Right. Okay. Great. Um. And then this is related. I mean, all these questions, I think, will spin off each other, really. But Lynn asks, um, how much virus has to get on you to infect you? And does it matter whether it enters through the nose, eyes, or mouth? So this is really, this is a, also an emerging question. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a recent paper that came out that said that dose, that, that means the number of virus particles you get is related to severity, how sick you get and how long the infection lasts, how long you replicate virus and keep it in your system. Mm -hmm. so, so dose is definitely important for getting infected and the course of the disease. But we don't really know a lot of the details behind that. Um, we know that the cell can bind to um, a set of receptors that definitely are common to the respiratory cells in our lower respiratory tract but there was a recent paper that showed samples of active replicating virus in the upper respiratory tract. So that presumes that anything you bring into your nasopharyngeal passage, um, those viruses can replicate and then they can get swept down into your lungs. So, you know, we used to, you, you, the alternative might have been that, oh, they can't re replicate in the upper respiratory. So, so long as you drink a lot of water and, you know, eat your food really fast then it'll get swept into your stomach and the stomach acid will kill it. It's like, no, it's, it's probably just fine in your upper respiratory tract for oh, replicating. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah, someone else actually asked, they said they were confused by having read that if you ate food that was <clears throat> contaminated with the virus, you would be okay, but then if it got in your mouth, it, you wouldn't. And they were trying to understand how to how to reconcile that, but it sounds like that's yeah. changed. Okay, it is. It's so confusing, and it's it's confused. It's okay to be confused because we're all confused because we don't. We you know the data truly is emerging in real time. It's amazing, and so that that paper that that sampled nasopharyngeal uh, tissues just showed that that virus is actually replicating in those tissues. So we didn't know that before. So. Right. We, you know, and stomach, we know this virus, lots of viruses are fine with stomach acid. This virus is not fine with stomach acid. So we know that uh, and once it gets in your stomach, it's dead. But so, yeah, it's important okay. data. Okay. <clears throat> um, so Mary Beth asked, does age or pre-existing conditions explain everything about who gets really sick versus who gets only a little bit sick? Or are there other factors we still don't understand? And I think you just mentioned that the how much virus you are. Yeah, dose mm -hmm. dose is huge. Um, <clears throat> you know what's really killing people is their immune response to the virus. So the the virus uh, is kicking um, people that get really sick, kicking their immune response into this dysregulated state where they are not able to roll it back. And it's what we call cytokine storm. So many of the signaling molecules that cause severe inflammation are not getting turned off, are not getting turned oh. down, dialed down. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, that's why the, you know, the, what we don't understand is why some people and, and particularly older people are having a dysregulated immune response. 
and it seems to be a totally different dysregulation than the kind that happens when you get influenza, which does infect young people as well as old people. So maybe that's the key. It's a difference. There are different pathways, different signaling molecules that are at play, and we still don't really understand. But dose now is another factor that's hugely important. Okay, great. Um, Susan asks, is there any hard evidence yet that people infected with COVID gain some level of immunity to it? I feel like, again, I've heard conflicting reports. Yeah, so, so the first hint that there is some kind of, so you can have a, a, a specific immunity, a, a specific immune response, but it might not necessarily be protective or the protection uh, depends on your antibody levels, your titer of antibodies, that, that, that's the mechanism of protection. And so the first data that showed that we elicit an immune response that's protective was when antibodies from exposed people were used to treat severe cases. So that means that there is an immune response. We, we think very good evidence suggesting that there's an immune response that neutralizes the virus. Mm. So that's that's known. I think that's pretty solid. I, I would bet on that. Okay. I think what we don't know is how long that would last. Is there a point where the antibody levels um, become not so neutralizing and they're just, you know, there, right? They, mm -hmm. they might not be as protective as they wane. So you have an, a waning immune response and that happens with flu all the time where we, um, we can detect an immune response, we can detect it through testing that for antibodies, but it's not particularly protective. And that could be because it's waned or because the virus has changed. So the big, big questions are not whether there's protective immunity, but how long it lasts mm -hmm. and how good it, is it at um, responding to strain variation in the virus. Right, okay. Um, Jonathan, and he's res he was responding to when you mentioned that um, bats didn't seem to be affected by COVID when they carry it. Is there anything that we can learn from their blood that could help humans? That's a great, that's a great question. We, there's, there, it's so um, amazing how many viruses are in bats. So uh, viruses that are Tend to, I mean, there's viruses everywhere. The whole system's teeming with viruses, but uh, there is a, a suspiciously high number that seem to be able to jump into humans. So what what is it? What is it about bats? Is it um, is it because they are in these? Some species are in very big colonies where they can um, transmit virus pretty easily between each other, and they just have tend to have tend to be able to sustain large virus population sizes, which correlates with large levels of diversity in a population, in a virus population. Um, that's, that's one hypothesis, although I think there are some solitary bats that have viruses. Well, I know they do, but I don't know if they spill over. But um, the other hypothesis is that they have, um, because they're the only mammal that is capable of sustained fight, flight, they actually run at a fever pitch. And so maybe they just, um, they can mitigate this sort of constant onslaught of viral infection mm -hmm. through um, just having a much uh, better regulatory system in terms of their own defenses, like mm -hmm. running at a fever pitch. Um, when the bat genomes first came online, everybody was scrambling to see whether they did have um, sort of different kinds of fundamental immune uh, encoding uh, regions or a system and it, nothing screamed out to be particularly divergent relative to other mammals uh, when the whole genome was done. But I think immune system is really tricky. It's a what we call a uh, encoded, it's a polygenetic trait. So it's encoded by genes all over um, mm -hmm. the genome and it's really hard to get a handle on. So okay. great questions. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. He asks, do we understand yet whether COVID is likely to be seasonal? <clears throat> uh, not really. Um, the seasonality underlying uh, virus infections can be driven by many, many, many different things. In some cases, it's based, you know, relates back to the sort of the biological properties of the virus itself. 
um, and how uh, how it might deal with an environmental conditions like heat or humidity. But remember, viruses don't spend that long outside. So if 72 hours on a surface, maybe mm -hmm. max, right? Most of the time compared to 21 days in, in a human. So most of their time is spent inside a human. And, mm -hmm. and the, so the seasonality of many viruses are really determined by what the humans are doing. So the, if the humans crowd up in the, in the fall and um, they increase the opportunities for transmission because they're all bundled up in a, in a single warm space and they're cheek by jowl, then probably the seasonality is more driven by human behavior. And, and that's, that's a large component of influenza seasonality because uh, see, flu can transmit at very low levels all year round in the tropics, and it doesn't really have a seasonal forcer in the tropics. It's in the temperate zone. Okay. Um, can you do five more questions or three more yes. questions? Or, oh, five more? Okay, great. Five more. Um, let's see here. So Sarah asked, and this we got a, actually several that are um, basically the same for this one. I've read everything I can, and I still don't know what to do as far as handling my mail and the groceries I have delivered. Can you advise? <laughs> So there was a, an interesting, uh, so again, right, we, we have to, where, where's the evidence and how right. was it collected, right? So there was one study uh, that, um, that, so up to the, before that study, we basically know everything we know from other viruses, similar viruses. So I run a virus lab and there's a whole manual on how to kill viruses. And, you know, I have a, a hood that irradiates viruses with UV and, uh, there's chemicals, uh, cleaning products that we use to disinfect the lab. Mm -hmm. um, the, the class of chemicals and approaches is, is related to the kind of virus. And this virus is an enveloped virus. So that means that it's, it's a package mm -hmm. of genetic material encapsulated in a sort of a protein-based structure that then is enveloped with a fat layer. And then this fat layer is... Um, uh, underlying the spike proteins that stick off. And, and so that fat layer actually, because that virus is structured that way, it's actually kind of a very delicate virus. If you break up that fat layer, you kill the virus. And lots of things can break up that fat layer. And that's why it's so very important to wash your hands with soap because soap disrupts that fat, fatty envelope. Um, and all those cleaning products like isopropanol and ethyl alcohol are really aimed at, dis at interrupting that fatty envelope. So, so this virus, we think it's in a class of viruses that's delicate and that is subjected to soap and cleaning and UV radiation and drying out. It dries out, it's not a very strong virus. Mm -hmm. But that was all what we knew from the class of viruses. And so there's not been a lot of studies that actually take this virus and look at how long it lasts on surfaces like male. And, and then how infectious it is. Even, right. if it, if, even if we can pick up the genomic, genetic signature, is it alive? Can it replicate? So there was one study that took the viruses um, and played it and smeared them out on different kinds of surfaces. They did copper, stainless steel, plastic, and cardboard. And they found that the virus actually lasted longest on plastic, and then it lasted up to 72 hours. So, what, you know, you know what I do? I open my mail, I discard the envelope, I go wash my hands. Um, some of my buddies, my neighbors are taking a wipe and wiping the mail. I think at the end of the day, we only know what we know. We know a lot more. We know a lot less than we know. And what we're really trying to do is mitigate risk, right? And mm -hmm. so the likelihood, the likelihood of you getting infected from a piece of fomite or a piece of virus on your mail is probably a lot less then when you go down to the grocery store without your cloth mask and you accidentally pass somebody in the aisle that sneezes. So it's really about mitigating your own risk and reducing the probability. Can we knock it to zero? At what cost? Uh, I think we just want to knock it back. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And I guess we can we can talk about the actual science that's been done on it, and we can talk about mitigating risk. But ultimately, it's really up to people to kind of come up with their own methods for yeah, like what makes sense to you in that context. Just yeah. to be clear about our, we can't right. tell you exactly what we, to oh, do. Yeah. We can tell I you am not. What makes yeah. Sense. yeah, I'm not right. a medical person or yeah. a public health official. Yeah, yeah, by no means. <laughs> yeah. But hopefully this information is, you know, helpful enough that it lets people be a little more confident about their methods or processes yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Great. Trudy asks, I read that um, countries overseas have banned eating certain kinds of animals. Do you think this will make a difference? And if not, what will? Well, I, you know, I do think that this brings to light the fact that we really need to consider our relationship with nature. and mm -hmm. um, the fact of the matter is that um, humans are dense and populous and uh, global, and we are creating many, many inroads into natural systems, whether it's through direct eating, diet, whether it's, um, you know, something cultural or something that's driven by desperation and lack of food security, like a lot of bushmeat hunting really is. Um, or whether it's habitat loss. So um, I, I definitely think that we need to uh, reduce our uh, hunting of many kinds of wildlife um, and how we also handle them, you know, store them live, interact with them live. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have to look to how we're um, making inroads in natural systems in other ways like habitat degradation and thinking about how that really does increase the opportunities for um, spillover events. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned with the bushmeat where a lot of that is really driven by desperation, it's, you know, and, yeah. or even like in the environmental degradation where people are cutting down things because they have to sell them to get food. It's also like, how do we take care of people so that they yeah. can yeah, afford to make better choices right. or different choices? Right. Yeah. We have to solve both problems. We, we can't yeah. just solve the environmental impacts, but the human health impacts of an emerging disease, but also the the food security and the and you know there are many many the the most vulnerable people in many cases are at the front lines of these um, right. this risk. So right. Right. they have to be solved. Yeah. Um, all right, three more questions. Um, last three. Hooper asks: When we beat a virus like the Spanish flu or the first SARS, does it disappear forever? Ah. Uh, so that's a great question. Um, so MERS, you know, bubbles up in health settings. So it's not gone. Right. Um, we haven't seen SARS, but um, Spanish flu, sections of that genome uh, popped up in the swine flu that emerged in H, uh, the H1N1 swine flu that emerged in uh, 2009. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, so uh, you know, I, I I I'm sure there are there's SARS um, is still in natural systems circulating mm -hmm. in natural systems. It's just that um, we haven't seen it arise in humans again, except for SARS too. Right. Uh, Melissa asks, do you have any advice for what to tell kids about when this will be over and how life might change going forward? Um, I have a 15 year old daughter, and she is a uh, uh, she's actually c kind of in uh, in a mixed uh, headspace right now. She's enjoying the crazy uh, schedule, yeah. <laughs> sleeping all day, staying up all night. Um, but she misses her friends, the physical connections, um, mm -hmm. the virtual connections are great. So I think I think depending on the age of the kid, I would definitely encourage. Um, virtual socialization as much as possible. But, um, you know, guessing when this might be over is really, is, it's really hard, especially if we get too excited and we don't stay the course and we flock back out to our playgrounds and our parks and start to gather, we could see a resurgence. And there has been a little resurgence in both China and South Korea. So um, I think, the, these kids are going to have some great stories to tell their kids about this momentous time. And in the meantime, kids in particular can really do their part by getting or washing their hands and helping to clean up and keep clean and stay the course. Yeah. Yeah. It, se it seems like we might see some kind of normalized 
different normalized behaviors like hand washing and maybe yeah. staying a little further from people during like seasons where we know stuff gets bad and even yeah. mass culture to some extent, which is like such a part of other countries, but not here. Yeah, like I know. I, it's it, it's as a, if you're a social scientist, I bet this would be a fascinating yeah. time. And as a virologist, I, I'm anticipating that flu is going to take a real hit this year. Because just because people will have better practices. For, yeah. Really yeah. Different, different practices that are now lasting so long that they might become inculcated into our personal habits. Yeah, that's really interesting. So we could yeah. see a decrease in how hard that hits p the population every year. Yes. And those yeah, deaths. Yeah, I agree. Uh, okay, last question. I thought we'd end with this because it's just a nice, a nice hopeful note to go out on. Leah asks, is there anything specific that you're excited about in terms of potential vaccines or other solutions being developed? Um, <clears throat> so I, my two, my, you know, my two favorite uh, lines of hope are, I, I really am excited by the kinds of testing that are, that are the new rapid tests, the new in, you know, post post-infection antibody-based tests, as well as direct protein tests. Um, I, you know, I liken this virus, this wave as, as a, like an iceberg, where right now we see the tiniest tip of the iceberg through yeah. our, our medical system, and we're, we're counting cases, and, we're, and m many of these cases, we're not counting them until they're already very severe. So the tip of the iceberg is super teeny to this massive, submerged, hidden, um, volume of infected people that we have, we can't even tell the shape of that iceberg, like who, what age class, when, where, why, let alone the numbers of the base of that iceberg. So I'm, I don't think we'll ever get a handle on this virus until we can uh, truly understand the form and size of that iceberg through much better testing, retrospective testing, as well as um, real time testing. Uh, and there are many new technologies that are we're we're just, we're poised on the precipice of really scaling them, and that's super exciting. And then uh, there are there are vaccine candidates. There are um, some molecular uh, based candidates that don't involve a live form of the virus that that could be um, rolled out earlier because they're they have good safety uh, profiles, but. Uh, Typically, molecular vaccines aren't as effective, so that all the vaccine mm -hmm. candidates out there are tr are basically looking at two main things: safety and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So, a, a vaccine might be safe, but if it only protects mm -hmm. fifty percent of the people, you know, it's a it, it's hard to um, decide when and, and where to roll it out. So, uh, there are I'm really excited to see a very nice sort of panoply of different strategies and we need to have them all to see which ones pan out especially since we know so little about how immunity to this virus works right yeah great thank you thank you so much yeah you're welcome everybody um yeah it's there great. were a lot of questions sorry that we um didn't get to that we will try to circle back and answer later in comments We'll drop some other resources in there related to COVID. We'll drop Shannon's Twitter and some other speaking that she's done. Um, but yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I know people really appreciated it. And thanks to everybody who asked questions too. Thank you everybody. And thanks Laurel for hosting. Yeah, for, oh, well, clearly not a professional but happy to step in during this time. Um, I'm so sorry that you dropped your coffee. Like that is the kind of tragedy that really like gets me right here. Oh. <laughs> I been know. thinking about it down there. Oh, yeah. I, know, like that. I hate that cup. It's too chippy. But well, I was too excited also. So well, maybe now you never have to deal with it again. Depending yeah. on that. <laughs> no, it's not broken. It's just coffee everywhere. Oh man, that's kind of a drink it. Yeah. final insult. Um, I'll just mention quickly before we go that next Friday we are going from very small to very big. The director of Morrison Planetarium at the Academy is going to take everyone to outer space with the same software that we usually use to pilot people through the dome. So come back for that. But um, yeah, thank you for watching. Again, Shannon, thank you so much for being here and everybody take care and go wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> take care, bye. bye.